All righty. Well, we're going to be continuing with our discussion on the solar system tonight and then uh, probably again my next time up, which uh, looks like December 10th, which we are confirmed with that. He's heading out. Just to let you know we're good on that. All right, cool. Well, uh, just a little bit of review and uh, giving uh, people an opportunity to take down the notes if you wanted that. Same as before. So if you took them down before, you probably still have that file. Otherwise, uh, just to look at the uh, outline that we have there as well. We, uh, and I wanted to always do a little bit of review. So, because what we're ultimately looking at is uh, to challenge the prevailing theories that are put forth by natural science. Because, I mean, uh, science has now become dominated by an atheistic worldview. They're trying to explain how the universe came into existence through purely natural processes and ultimately how we came into existence you you know these natural processes and and it's a it's a terrible thing that they're teaching you know they're they're convincing people that that uh, of, a, of a terrible lie that this world formed all by itself and therefore is insignificant and and that we're nothing but a bunch of evolved apes and therefore not significant and when you think people are just another a bunch of animals well, you'll treat them that way. And if you assume you're nothing but an animal, you will behave that way. You'll treat yourself that way. And that's what we have today. And so it's very important that the church today be, uh, stand up against the false teachings of natural science because that's what they are, false teachings and or lies. So with regarding the origin of the solar system, I had mentioned the nebula theory before. This is the prevailing theory to explain the origin of the solar system. And they believe that one of these clouds of gas and dust that we called nebula ma managed to somehow magically become more and more condensed and reach the, a point of density where um, stars would be birthed within this. And uh, that this, this gas and dust cloud began swirling perhaps uh, due to regional movements of the, within the uh, galaxy itself causing that movement. And then this swirling mass somehow or another magically became Came, uh, our solar system. This is the prevailing theory. They assert that this nebula began rotating due to, as I say, regional movements of the galaxy. It, it then collapsed or became more condensed somehow. They have various uh, theories to explain how ga gas and one of these gas clouds become more condensed. And then a central bulge in the middle formed that became the sun. Smaller planets of material became smaller portions of material through what we call accretion, um, began uh, to uh, create the large Larger, ever larger particles start by dust grains and then rock, bigger rocks and then eventually you know things like asteroids and planetesimals and planets form this is the prevailing theory to explain the, that to use to explain the origin of the solar system and but we're, we're looking to challenge this by just taking a, a review of the solar system its various planets and and moons and um, so we had already looked at we already looked at a couple of these last time in particular we looked at mercury some of the peculiar aspects of mercury that defy uh, the nebula theory hypothesis and we and then we came to find out uh, that uh, the, the the main theory behind the to explain the unusual features of uh, Venus was that a large impact had taken place uh, and a large impact it is believed that a that early in the, in the history of, of its formation, an asteroid must have crashed into Mercury, stripping off the lighter material, leaving behind what's there. And then, uh, as we continue to see this this uh, explanation of cosmic collisions, as we as we move through this, you see it's very common. It's the predominant mechanism that is used to explain the unusual features of the solar system that don't line up with the nebula theory. So we also looked at uh, Venus, and then uh, we uh, we are taking we took a little bit of a look at the Earth and uh, some of the, in particular the uh, design features that we find in there. The Earth itself is a very very special place. It, uh, just to review some of that, it has a magnetic field which uh, protects us from cosmic collisions by providing us with a magnetosphere. It's not just there to to help our compasses work. It is just the right size and just the right distance. It's just at the right position in the solar system, the right distance from the sun. If uh, it's, it's at the correct position within the galaxy as well, what's called the galactic habitable zone. Our sun is the perfect mass and composition to provide the perfect amounts of heat and light. And uh, our atmosphere as well is there to protect us from radiation. 
But we also have a, one other very special feature that makes, makes our uh, the earth very special. But let me review quickly. I do have a, do I have sound ready for it to go on this, James? I, he, I, he asked and I was like, I don't know. I bet I think I do. Uh, so here we go. The Bible teaches that the earth was specially designed by God to be inhabited. The earth has just the right chemicals for life. About 99% of the universe is made of hydrogen and helium, but the earth is different. It's made of heavier elements which can form compounds essential for life. The earth has a large moon which keeps the oceans from stagnating and a magnetic field which shields us from harmful radiation. The earth appears to be an engineering marvel crafted for life, the stage for unfolding God's glorious plan to dwell with man. And the earth is itself so bizarrely perfect and that it's, a, it's kind of dumbfounding that, uh, that scientists, especially your astronomers that know so much about the cosmos, can, can still you know, get it within their mind that such a thing could form, as perfect as it is. Uh, surrounded by the great enveloping cosmic dark, as Carl Sagan, Sagan called it, we find this planet that's just perfect, uh, perfect in so many ways. But beyond the earth, there's nothing but black death surrounding us and that they can't see that, that this place just shouldn't be here. It's just, it's almost magical. It's so bizarrely perfect, it's almost magical. And in fact, there's a school of thought, a real school of thought that we are actually in a computer simulation. This, it's a, it's a, you, you see it popped up in sci-fi, so, uh, The Matrix, if you ever seen The Matrix, it was found these people that, people were all living, uh, all in reality in a computer simulation and they just didn't know it. Well, that, that's a real school of thought. It's, sometimes today it's hard to figure out whether sci-fi gets its ideas from science or whether science gets its ideas from science fiction. It's hard to, hard to really say at some point, but this is a real school of thought because it's just too bizarrely perfect. Well, how can this planet, be, how can this be here? It just, it shouldn't be here. Surrounded is that, at, from what we know of the universe, it, it really just shouldn't be here. Well, although the earth is made of, has a number of really special features that uh, permit life to be possible, it has one other feature that is really, really important for life, and that's our moon. The moon is, exa is exactly the right, it's exactly the right size for the earth, but our moon, interestingly, is the fifth largest moon in the solar system. It is by far the largest relative to its to the planet. Uh, for comparison, our moon has a radius that is 27% of the Earth. So it's 27% the size of the Earth. It's, it's just absolutely massive. And then when you compare the moons of every other planet in the solar system, it's by far crazy large in comparison to the others. The next largest moon relative to a major planet is Triton of Neptune, which is just 5.4% the size of Neptune. So the next largest moon is only 5% the size of the planet. Ours is 27% the size of the Earth. It's just absolutely massive, which creates some very unusual problems in trying to explain its origin. And we're gonna focus on that. Uh, the moon's diameter is over 50% greater, in fact, than even Pluto. I mean, it's, the thing is just absolutely massive for the size of a planet. But it is, it exa it's, <clears throat> it is exactly the right distance to create uh, favorable tides. It is uh, because of the moon that we have, not only does the, are the oceans circulated, preventing them from becoming stagnated, but also the atmosphere as well. The moon creates a gravitational force that creates these tides and tidal currents. It's close enough so that its gravity creates tides and prevents our oceans and atmosphere from stagnating, it's, but it's far enough away so that the, the tides are not harmful for us. Well, what does the moon do for us? Well, one of the things it does, it stabilizes the Earth's rotation and also stabilizes the Earth's tilt, which is responsible for our seasons. Our seasons are caused as the Earth tilted on its axis travels in a loop around the sun. So summer happens on the hemisphere or the side of the Earth that's closest to the sun. Winter happens on the, on the side of the Earth or the hemisphere that's furthest away from the sun. 
As the Earth travels around the sun, the, the hemisphere that is tilted towards the Earth becomes summer. As it travels the other side, the, the side that's tilted uh, away from the sun experiences winters. Well, the moon is uh, uniquely positioned also to serve as signs and uh, to mark seasons and days and years, as stated in Genesis. One way we do this is by observing the lunar shadows, which are used to track the progression of time through months. So it's like a clock for us, but it's also an important night light. I mean, how dark would this place be at night if it wasn't for the moon? I mean, a scary dark to be sure. Well, the moon has been intensely studied both uh, from uh, a distance and directly. The moon is, remains the only astronomical body that humans have visited, although we've set down spacecrafts on a number of other astronomical bodies, including asteroids. One of the purposes of the Apollo missions, uh, what Apollo 15 is shown here, was to study the moon, its composition, what it was made of, as a way of coming to an understanding of its origin. Most people don't know that the Apollo missions, one of the main folk, uh, goals of the Apollo missions was to try to answer the question about the moon's origin, which is uh, still largely unanswered today. Well, these missions produced some interesting findings and some uh, unusual surprises. For example, when Apollo, uh, when the Apollo spacecraft traveled to the dark side of the moon, now, the moon, if you don't know, is tidally locked to us. We seem to see the same side of the moon all the time. It's not spinning on its axis the way the Earth is. It's locked in its position. Well, when, uh, when the Apollo reached the other side of the moon, what they saw was that these dark patches called Maria that we see on our side uh, were conspicuously absent on the other side of the moon. Now, what these Maria, uh, these, so the Maria are, stand out as these dark, smooth areas that you see there, which are distinct from the surrounding terrain that is very heavily cratered. Maria, as far as we know, were our lava flows. These are, have, these are areas that were partially, partly flooded by lava when, uh, when volcanoes erupted on the moon, probably as a result of some massive impacts that triggered volcanic flows. The lava then froze, forming the rocks that uh, on the surface. Since that time, meteorite uh, craters have, uh, have created, uh, you know, meteorite impacts have created a number of craters even within the Maria, like you can see here. You can see the smooth patch, and then there's a, a big crater right in the middle of that. Well, if the moon were truly billions of years old, as uh, astronomers claim, then you would expect it to be reasonably uniform. The absence of Maria on the dark side indicate that at one point in time, fairly recently it would seem, the moon suffered some uh, a terrible catastrophe. Some have suggested that an asteroid shower might have triggered even the global flood. What actually broke up the Earth's surface is unclear, but the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and, and uh, some have argued that it may have been uh, an, an astronomical event. And also interesting, I don't know if I mentioned this elsewhere, there's, there's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. There's a massive asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, the origin of which is, is to some degree a mystery as well. And some have argued that there might have been a planet at that location that broke up and uh, perhaps showered the Earth at that point in time, triggering the global flood. Again, it's can't say for sure. Could it have been the mighty finger of God that broke up the Earth's crust? It could have been, or it could have, you know, used a, an event such as that, destroyed a nearby planet, causing that, that to rain down upon the Earth. Well, Apollo 11 was the most uh, famous space mission of, of modern times, uh, during which uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. This picture you see here um, may be one of the most uh, famous pictures of all time, showing uh, the astronaut Buzz Aldrin on walking on the lunar surface. Apollo 11 collected rocks and soil and uh, placed some instruments, including the first of three seismometers. Yeah, that's what's one of, what's one of what, which are being placed right there. Seismometers detect uh, seismic activities, earthquakes, and uh, in, this, in this case would be moonquakes, but Apollo 15 carried the uh, third seismometer uh, placed on the moon. After it was deployed, the simultaneous operation of three working instruments permitted calculations of the seismic properties of the, the lunar interior. In total, the Apollo missions brought back 2,415 samples of moon rocks and soil, weighing a total of 842 pounds. 
during uh, the six lunar expeditions from 1969 to 1972. Rocks that were brought back include Mare Basalt, uh, lava flow from uh, one of those Maria and breccia uh, formed from uh, the one on the rise formed from pieces of different rocks that were shattered and melted and then mixed together by uh, great meteor meteorite impacts that rocked the moon at some point in its history well the main purpose for collecting the uh, rocks and uh, the soil samples was to help answer the question of how the moon formed through natural processes. Of course, that's how it, that's how it formed, right? Well, the three competing theories at the time were these. Number one, it formed, it formed near the Earth as a separate body by accretion. Remember, accretion is a mechanism where these dust particles would, everything has a gravity, and the larger a particle is, the more gravity it has, and you have electrostatic forces that cause particles to become attracted to one another as well. So what the combination of electrostatic forces and, uh, gra and gravitational forces would cause particles to start sticking together, more and then more particles stick together, more particles stick together. This is what they call the accretion uh, theory that, uh, for the formation of uh, the astronomical bodies. And that's, uh, so it believed that, uh, that, the, that the moon formed near the Earth as a separate body, both of them forming by accretion. The second is that it formed somewhere else and was captured by the Earth. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The third is that it formed as part of the Earth and uh, separated from it uh, with, by fission. So it was part of the Earth and then uh, broke away from the Earth and uh, just resides near us. And we're gonna discuss each of these theories to see if any of them square with the, uh, the following facts. Number one, the moon has a low density, uh, 3.5 gram per cubic centimeter, that shows it does not have a substantial iron core like the Earth does. The moon's rocks contain few volatile substances, uh, like water, which implies extra baking of the lunar surface as taking place relative to that of the Earth. So there's a big difference there. And uh, the relative abundance of oxygen isotopes on Earth and on the moon are identical, uh, which suggests that the Earth and moon formed at the same distance from the sun. So we're gonna look at each of these theories to see if they square with these three facts and others. All right, starting with the accretion model. Uh, the accretion theory, uh, uh, <clears throat> Again, this is a, the, uh, the formation of things through electrostatic forces and gravity going to cause particles to stick together. Well, the, uh, th this theory proposes that the moon and the earth condensed individually from a, a, during, from a nebula, that swirling cloud of gas and dust that formed the solar system, with the moon forming in orbit around the earth. So they formed at the same time through uh, accretion. Particles are combined due to gravitational attraction leading to ever larger celestial bodies. And then the moon formed out of the same material as the Earth. The, uh, the accretion theory would, would hold that the Earth and the moon would be very, very similar in composition if they both formed at the same time, they, uh, at the same distance from the sun. Well, if the moon formed in, uh, in the vicinity of the Earth, it should have nearly the same composition. However, the Apollo missions found that the lunar rocks were substantially different from the Earth's, challenging this theory. The moon should possess a significant iron core, as the Earth does, but it does not. The physics of two objects condensing together uh, is problematic as well. Also, the hypothesis does not have a natural explanation for the extra baking the lunar material seems to have received. Also, the moon has a, a different chemical composition than the Earth, which uh, some scientists believe points to it having formed as a separate body elsewhere, either near or far, and was captured by the Earth. This is our, our other, one of the other leading th theories. Now, these were the prevailing theories at the time of the Apollo missions, and they, the, one of the things they were trying to answer was which of these theories actually squared with the facts. So this, this theory is called the capture theory, which proposes that the moon was formed elsewhere in the solar system and was later captured by the Earth's gravitational field. Well, the, the moon's different chemical composition could be explained if it formed elsewhere in the solar system. However, capture um, into, uh, into 
the moon's present orbit is very problematic in terms of the physics that would be necessary. Something would have to slow it down at just the right amount, at just the right time, and scientists are reluctant to believe in such fine tuning. It would re almost require that some mighty force just happen to just slow it down at just the right time, at just the right moment. Also, this hypothesis does not uh, have a natural explanation for the extra baking of the lunar material that I mentioned previously. However, and this viol also violates some basic laws of physics. As it approaches, uh, it will, it will sp the moon would speed up and uh, develop sufficient velocity to escape Earth's gravity. The energy would need to be uh, somehow reduced uh, what reduced its speed at just the right moment is would be is unclear. Also, the oxygen isotopes again are identical on the Earth and the Moon, suggesting they formed at the same distance from the Sun, which argues against the capture theory. The other main theory we were looking at called, was called the fission theory. Uh, fission theory states that the Moon or originally was part of the Earth and separated from the Earth due to Earth rapid spinning that maybe that Earth was spinning much more rapidly than it is today and basically flung off the moon. The uh, Pacific Ocean Basin is, is believed to perhaps be where the moon originated uh, by some. This theory was thought possible since the Earth's composition resembled that of the, or, uh, the moon's composition resembles the Earth's mantle in some ways. However, tests of the lunar rocks brought by, by Apollo reveal that the moon is relatively deficient in iron. Also, the present day, uh, the present day Earth moon system should contain fossil evidence of this rapid spin, and it does not. And like others, this hypothesis does not have an explanation for the extra baking the lunar material has received. Plus, uh, to be possible, the Earth's rotation would need to be incredibly fast, uh, once every 2.6 hours or so. And that would have to be incredibly fast to have flung something of the size of the moon uh, from, its own, from its own mass. Getting a planet spinning that fast from a, a nebula is already problematic, as we will discuss in a little bit when looking at, uh, the, at the rapid rotation of Jupiter. But uh, if it was spinning at, at such speed originally, that creates another problem, the massive energy dissipation that would uh, take place while slowing to its present spin. Uh, Baldwin discusses, discusses this in his book, A Fundamental Survey of the Moon. He said, if the rotation of the Earth had been slowed by tidal friction from four, the speed it would have to be to fling off something like the moon, to 24 hours, what it is today, there would have been a massive energy dissipa dissipation, sufficient to raise the temperature of the entire Earth by 1,000 degrees C. Such a uh, heat would have boiled away all of the oceans that we have today, so that's not very likely. Although it was hoped that the Apollo missions would help solve the mystery of a moon's origin, the data instead argued against all, all of them, all of the prevailing theories. The creation theory, the capture theory, and the fission theory were all blew, blown away by the Apollo mission data. Several years after the Apollo program concluded, which was again between 1961 and 1972, there was still no agreement about the origin of the moon. As uh, Burian states here in 1975, this is several years after the Apollo missions concluded. He says uh, in his book, uh, The New Moon, A Window on the Universe, he said, in spite of, of everything that we have learned uh, during the past uh, last few years during the Apollo missions, we still cannot decide between these three theories. We still, we will need more data and perhaps some new theories before the origin of the moon is settled to everyone's satisfaction. So, following the Apollo missions, a new theory was developed. Yeah, a super asteroid mm -hmm, is, uh, saves the day once again to explain the origin of the moon. It is argued and believed today that a Mars-sized asteroid ha had, has impacted the Earth at some point leading to the formation of the moon. NASA's World Book Online Reference Center summarized the theory this way. They say, quote, scientists believe that the moon formed as a result of a collision known as the giant impact or the big whack. 
<laughs> According to this idea, the Earth collided with a moon, a planet-sized object, 4.6 e billion years ago. As a result of the impact, a cloud of vaporized rock shot off Earth's surface and went into orbit around the Earth. The cloud cooled and condensed into a ring of small, solid bodies, which then gathered together, forming the moon. But uh, it's, there's no proof for this. It's just a story, not even a necessarily good story. The only support are computer simulations that require everything to be just right. Uh, also requires the moon to have formed 4.5 billion years ago, at least at the very birth of the solar system. The solar system itself is believed to be 4.6 billion years old. And there, this had to have happened literally right at the very moment that these, this thing had to form. So, and the, the others, the other mysteries, why doesn't Venus have a, a moon, which is uh, again, our sister planet, should be very similar to ours. Well, we need to keep in mind that these uh, are just just theories put forth to answer how these things could form naturally rather than by creation. Analysis of the giant uh, impact and, and fission hypothesis for the origin of the moon pub was published in the International Geology Review concluded that, quote, the origin of the moon is still unresolved. I think the best explanation for, of the evidence is that the moon was created in, the present, in its present orbit very recently, as described in the book of Genesis. Well, the Apollo astronauts also installed laser-ranging retroreflectors on the moon. The first was placed on the moon in 1969 by the Apollo 11 missions. Um, Several additional reflectors were placed by, by, the, uh, uh, by later Apollo uh, missions. Uh, the alphanumeric that you see, A11, shows the, uh, where the, the Apollo 11 crew placed theirs within the Sea of Tranquility, one of those uh, Maria. And uh, you see several others, A14, A15, for example, were placed by those Apollo missions. The one that's labeled L, the L designation are, are, are placements by the Russia-France uh, Luna robotic uh, probe that placed some reflectors there as well. Well, what these, were for, what these reflectors are for are for laser ranging. Uh, ranging. They d determine the distance. So by beaming laser pulses at these reflectors from Earth, scientists have been able to determine the distance between uh, the Earth and uh, the moon to a great deal of accuracy um, uh, at, at, you know, accurate at, at almost any time by, by, by a precision of up to about three centimeters. Well, what they discovered with these uh, laser uh, range, uh, mix, or ranging uh, findings <clears throat> is that the moon is moving away from the earth at a rate of about four centimeters per year. So the moon is receding from the earth at a rate of about four centimeters per year. And this was determined using these uh, fancy uh, laser, laser finding things. However, uh, this creates a big problem. Looking backwards in time, the recession weight would be even faster than it is today. This is because lunar recession is caused by tidal forces. The moon is, is, is actually pulling the oceans away from the earth towards itself, and this causes the earth to bulge. This bulge pulls back on the moon, causing it to accelerate. Well, because the moon's gravitational force is stronger, the closer you are to it, the moon would have caused larger tidal bulges in the distant past, creating an, an even greater pulling force, increasing the angular momentum. Thus, the moon receded at a much greater speed in the past, as shown by the red arrows that you see there. Here are the calculated distances. <laughs> Looking back in time, the moon is currently at 240,000 miles away from the Earth, but would have been 28.4 miles closer a million years ago. And although the solar system is believed to be 4.5 billion years old, based on current uh, rates of recession, the moon would be in contact with the Earth 1.4 billion years ago. You know, some people don't like tables of data, so here you go. If this is uh, helpful, uh, prefer, you know, the moon go boom 1.4 billion years ago. Okay, doesn't really work. You know, it's uh, at its present uh, rate of recession. Mm hmm. 
Well, the truth is the moon was uniquely designed for us. What we're not being told about the moon, there exists, no, exists today no sound explanation for its origin. Lunar recession says it can't be billions of years old, and they've even found a, a, a transient lunar phenomena, periodic uh, volcanic uh, emissions still seem to be happening on the moon that uh, can't, that argue that it can't be billions of years old, because something that old should be old, cold, and dead by this point. Well, let's look at, look at Mars. Well, Mars is the next closest planet to us, and it has also been intensely studied. NASA has sent over 10 spacecrafts to the planet Mars, each at a cost of about uh, uh, between 100 million to several billion dollars each. Well, the primary mission of these spacecrafts was to find signs of life. That's why we're sending these ridiculously expensive probes to Mars to try to search for signs of life. And that is because uh, uh, all, all attempts to explain the origin of life here on Earth have ended in failure. It was presumed originally that the Earth must have had a, a non-oxygen atmosphere, a re what we call a reducing atmosphere in chemistry. Uh, non-oxygen atmosphere would have allowed things like amino acids to form. But now it appears clear from uh, geologic analysis of the Earth's oldest rocks that the Earth seems to have always had an oxygen atmosphere, putting all the attempts to explain the origin of life on Earth uh, at, at risk. But so now they're hoping to find the evidence of life, life elsewhere. It couldn't have originated here on Earth, so they're looking for, with hope that it formed elsewhere in the solar system and elsewhere in the universe. NASA's uh, Perseverance rover was, was the latest to touch down safely on the red planet, which landed in February 2021. But is, it was the third most expensive Mars mission at a cost of $2.7 billion. $2.7 billion to send a, a little robot to Mars to try to solve the mystery of the origin of life. The goal of this uh, latest mission uh, is, is summarized by NASA. They say, one of the mission's uh, primary goals is to explore the geology of this Jezera crater in order to assess past habitability whether it could be in, was inhabited in the past. The rover Perseverance will provide important data relevant to astrobiology. Biology out in the stars. Right. This is, this is NASA, NASA's main goal today is what's called astrobiology or exobiology. They're not, look, not trying to figure out how the universe runs anymore. They're looking for the search for the origin of life. <clears throat> relevant to astrobiology research, along with the vast amounts of geological information about the landing site and the planet at large that will help put the astrobiological data into context. Perseverance will not be looking for organisms living on Mars today. However, the rover will collect data that could be used to identify biosignatures of ancient microbial life. That's now NASA's main focus is the search for the origin of life because they have not been able to show how even the building blocks for life could form could have formed here much less the big macro molecules and they can't even come up with a good theory to explain the origin of amino acids something like one of the building blocks here much less something as complex as a chain of amino acids or a full-blown protein so now they're looking for it elsewhere well, let's look at a little bit of Mars. Mars is a planet of extremes. It is the largest volcano in the solar system, shown here, Olympus Mons, or Mount Olympus, if you don't like the Latin, shown here. The base of this volcano is the size of the state of Missouri. Massive dust storms come up uh, suddenly on Mars that cover the entire planet. These uh, dust storms dramatically affect the temperatures on Mars. Here's some uh, thermal infrared measurements by the thermal emission spectrometer orbiting Mars aboard the Mars Global Surveyor, which showed how the Martian atmosphere was, subs was substantially warmed during the ongoing dust storms that they recorded back in 2001. It also has the biggest canyon in the solar system, shown here, Valles Marineris, or the Mariner Valley. This canyon extends 3,000 kilometers long, uh, spans as much as 600 kilometers across, and delves as much as 8 kilometers deep. This is a canyon the size of the continental U.S. Size 
the size of the continental U.S. Well, one of the big questions being asked by NASA today is, was there liquid water on Mars? Of course, everything we know about life today says life requires water. Water is extremely, extremely important for life and a completely bizarre model. Molecule. In all of chemistry, there's nothing that behaves like water. There are many molecules very similar to water in terms of the atoms that are there, but it, nothing behaves like that molecule does. It is because of that, most of our, uh, most of our uh, um, units of measure are based on water. Uh, so whether it's the temperature, it's the Celsius scale is based on the freezing point and boiling point of water. Specific heat is based on water. The latent heat is based on water. And the density scale is based on water. I mean, these all, the vast majority of our units of measure are based on water. It's a completely bizarre molecule. But, uh, and it's requiring a tremendously, a tremendous requirement for life. So the NASA points to uh, erosion features like this to claim that Mars once had water and therefore could have been the place where life originated. However, we need to keep in mind that both gases and liquids have fluidic properties. Both are behave as fluids and thus can cause erosion in similar manners. Uh, uh, so that, that these canyons were eroded by water, just because it's a canyon doesn't mean it's eroded by water is my main point here. And uh, so NASA has claimed that a geologic feature in the Elder's Wall crater, I'm gonna blow this up for you. Um, well, I'll highlight it and enlarge it for you there. It, they argue that this is a delta Deltas are uh, for, form when rivers uh, empty into a larger body and then dump their sedimentary load at the mouth of that body of water, forming a big fan-shaped deposit called a, what we call a, a delta. And they argue that this, uh, this is a delta right here that must have formed when uh, Mars once had liquid water. Mm. But... Uh, but we can, we can find other features on Mars. So for example, uh, we, we've observed gullies forming on Mars in the absence of liquid water. Uh, in these two side-by-side -side comparative photos, a gully about 300 meters long formed between July 2002 and April 2005. Now, geologic features like gullies and canyons are not proof, again, that liquid water has been there in the past, but merely that erosion happened there in the past because this clearly didn't happen by water it's it's uh, happened by through uh, atmospheric or, or winds instead the reality is there is no evidence that mars ever had liquid water evolutionists to want desperately to find evidence of water elsewhere because all experiments attempting to prove spontaneous generation or the origin of life here on earth have been in failure Again, that's, that's why it's become one of NASA's main goals today is to find evidence of water elsewhere or carbon. Those are the two big things they're looking for, water and carbon elsewhere to try to argue that life uh, arose there. And it's a main, this is the main sci-fi genre as well, uh, that life caught a ride here somehow or another. But the space is very inhospitable. Not very hospitable to life, catch a bacteria or something catching a ride on some asteroid and making its way all the way here still in, alive. Because of that, there are many uh, people uh, that, that believe, uh, in fact, uh, uh, mm. One of the uh, one of the uh, people, one of the guys who discovered the DNA helix believes that uh, that uh, in what's called directed panspermia. So panspermia is the theory that life caught a ride here somehow from some other planet on like an asteroid or whatnot. But some uh, hold to the, the what's called directed panspermia that life was actually brought here by an ancient by a space a space civilization at some point in the past. It's a, it's a real theory. And again, you see that popping up in all kinds of sci-fi movies, but again, whether sci-fis get their ideas from science or whether science gets their ideas from science fiction, you can't really tell anymore because you see such an overlap between the two. Well, the problem is liquid water on Mars is simply not possible today because it would boil away in hours. And we also see problems that are with recent soil samples brought by some of our probes found the only trace amounts of carbonates uh, like uh, you know, li limestone and instead found minerals like olivine, which break down in the presence of water. The current theory is 
that Mars once had atmosphere, an atmosphere capable of sustaining liquid water, but uh, asteroids smashed into it, stripping away its atmosphere. However, there is a vector, there's there is a better explanation for the evidence of liquid water on Mars, and uh, such claims are merely wishful thinking and based on spe the speculations that life originated elsewhere in the cosmos. This is probably a, a good place to take a, for us to a pause here, if I, uh, unless I'm a little early. Are we good? All right. What we're going to be looking at next, so when we come back next time, we've kind of take, we looked at a number of our terrestrial planets. Remember, the, the, the planets cl closer to the sun are terrestrial or rocky planets, we, but we also want to take a little bit of a tour of some of our gas giants when we come back. So when we come back, we're going to take a look at Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to see if these planets as well, their, or the, their characteristics align with the nebula theory. And uh, not just be looking at these planets, but we're going to be looking at some of their moons as well. So to, to show that there's, there's, there's a lot of uniqueness there. I mean, moons that should be basically identical to one another if these things formed through a nebula hypothesis are in fact very, very unique from one another. Even some of the moons of Jupiter, the moons of, moons of Saturn, very, very unique. Now let me go ahead and close this out there in Word of Prayer. And when we come back, we're going to be looking at some of the gas giants, more of the tour of the solar system. Father God, we thank you so much for today, Lord. We, uh, we just um, humble ourselves before you, Father God, acknowledging ourselves as sinners, Father God, and asking for the forgiveness of sins, Lord. Lord, we ask tonight, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Lord, help us to forgive as we should. Lord, if there's unforgiveness in us, Lord, help us to identify it. If we are holding grudges, if we're holding a grudge, an unforgiveness from something recently or something in our, in the, our distant past, Lord, I'd help us to identify that and, and recall it today and, and, uh, and, and forgive, Lord, because we understand that we will be judged by the same, by how we ju judge others, Father, and we will be forgiven in a way that we forgive. Father God, so help us to forgive others if there's unforgiveness in us, and, and Lord, keep us from, from, from judging others, recognizing, Father, tonight that we are sinners, terrible, wretched sinners. And although we may not have not committed the same sins that others have, Lord, that we have sinned greatly ourselves, Father, with the full knowledge that your Son has died for us in such a terrible, miserable way, Father. Father, we truly have no right to judge anyone, sinners as we are, Father God. Help us to forgive and help us not to judge, Father God. Help the love that we should have for our neighbors to grow inside of us. Father God, we know that the most important of the laws is to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, to the same amount that we love ourselves. Father God, help us, Lord, for that love to grow inside of us. Lord, so we not, are not just patient and kind with those that are around us, but we have the love for them that we have for ourselves, that we look out for them this, to the same amount that we look out for ourselves, that we would give, for, give them the way we give ourselves. Father God, we, uh, we ask for your help, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and help us to show love to the people around us, Father. When we find them annoying, when we find, uh, when, we are pro when we start to judge them, help us to remember, Lord, how much you love these people that are around us, that you love them so much that you sent your son to die in that horrible, miserable way to save them from their sins. Father God, help us to remember how much you love the people that we see when they're walking down the sidewalk, when they're in the supermarket, people that we know are in, in the grip of sin, Father God, instead of judging them, help us to show them love, the kind of love and compassion we should show. Father God, we, uh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for this wonderful world that you made for us, Father. We see your love all around us and the beauty and the perfection of the world that you made for us, the pleasures that we see in the world around us. We see your love that has been poured out for us. Praise you, Father God. Father, we praise you. We worship you, Lord God. We praise your holy name. Praise you, Lord. 
And thank you. Thank you for this world you made. Thank you for the life that you've given. Thank you for the forgiveness that you've offered through the death of your son, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen.